Hello and welcome back to Killer Tea Spiller. Um, if you want to skip the introduction, again, just jump to the number on screen. I'll take you right to the start of this new case. But if you want to listen, I just want to say a few things that won't take too long. First of all, if you watched the previous video, the Robert Durst video, I just want to say a massive thank you. That case was so confusing, so obfuscating. The story itself, even like at laying out in front of you, is quite ridiculous. It's really difficult to follow. But I was trying to contend with so many different sources to make sure that the information I was putting out to you was as accurate as possible. Um, again, so there would be one case that one, one source that says such a thing, and then another source that says something different. So I had to back up either source to make sure I was actually getting the story across properly. It was the first time editing anything of this nature. So if you stuck with it, I know it was really choppy. I know I was really um, nervous speaking really quickly. Something I'm going to try and work on in this video. Um, just the support meant a lot, and I want I just want to say everyone who subscribed so far, I really appreciate that you took the time to do that and you want to hear more from me. Hopefully I will get stronger and stronger and stronger as I go along. So this is my second video. Hopefully it'll be a bit snappier, a bit um, more coherent. And yeah, let's grow together. Today's case is going to be about an individual called Thomas Patera. The Thomas Patera case is a lot less popular than the Robert Durst case was, or popular is the wrong word to use, but a lot, a lot less infamous than the Robert Durst case. The Robert Durst case within itself kind of hit mainstream media. I think it was because he was this big wealthy scion of a really like wealthy family, um, whereas Thomas Patero is a bit more humble in his upbringing, a bit more uh, under the radar. And also, Thomas Patera case, he, he, he was involved heavily, as we'll find out in the video properly, in the Mafia, which in and of itself, you kind of sort of accept Killam as part and parcel of that kind of lifestyle, um, which, which is true, it is. But the reason this person stood out to me so clearly was because he kind of veered over into the territory of serial killing. It, it seemed as if this particular person had a thrill from doing what he did and he did a kind of um he, he did extracurricular killings so again we'll, we'll find out as we go along but a lot of this a lot of what he did it seemed to be outside of the realms of what he was needed for within the mafia but we'll get into that as we go along first of all i want to talk about him him as a person so thomas patera was born in gravesend brooklyn new york in 1954 on the 2nd of december so gravesend supposed to be this really wonderful place it's nowhere near as wealthy as our previous um killers was but by no means is it sort of stricken with poverty from 1954 to now it's had little spouts and little spikes here and there of crime rates going up but in general it's not a bad place to live it's seems to be very um, middle of the range, very safe, very comfortable place to live in. Um, his father was Joseph Patera and his mother was Catherine Patera and he was an only child, it was just Thomas. His dad had a very humble job, he worked in the confectionery industry, so he used to buy um, wholesale and then sell it off to other shops. And his mother worked generally as a, as a housemaker, she, she was a stay at home mum, she looked after Tommy, um, there's not much to say about the family life within itself. It seemed to be quite a normal, positive, average, run of the mill nuclear family. Tommy himself as a child was really diminutive. He was um, very dainty. He had a really high pitched voice. And um, where he studied in uh, David A. Booty High School, which was in Gravesend, he was particularly um, targeted by a lot of the other children there. Um, which is really strange because a lot of the reasons they targeted him seemed to be things that were a positive. I guess that stems a lot in regards to their jealousy or their self-consciousness. So they would pick him up because he had this, um, it, it's described as thick velvety black hair. He had these really piercing eyes, these high cheekbones. But I guess because he stood out so much, like he was it's described as um, a striking looking child, I think it would draw attention to him but because he was so small, because he had a higher pitched voice, um, this obviously um, would go on a derision from his peers. So throughout his school life, he was bullied quite a lot, quite heavily, to a point where by the time he was only eight years old, his parents sort of enrolled him onto martial arts classes just so he can defend himself a little bit. So the martial arts within itself was something that Tommy already had a fascination in. He was a massive fan of any TV program that revolved around martial arts. 
His all-time favourite actor was Bruce Lee. He was obsessed with Bruce Lee. He loved everything about him, all the movies, all the series. He just thought it was so wonderful, so exciting that this man was this unstoppable fighting machine. His favourite movie slash series was The Green Hornet, which is about this like this crime fighting duo. This was the first time that sort of Asian martial art was really heavily introduced into American mainstream media and into daytime TV. And Thomas Patero was just blown away by it. He was looking at this and he was like, this guy is so handy, so useful. I think he was just so excited to see a different culture in this American TV show. You know, Bruce Lee was kind of the odd one out, as it were, like he was at school. And Bruce Lee within, and not only within this, Bruce Lee within most of his roles, he wasn't the sort of person who went out looking for trouble. He, he didn't star fight, he didn't go out wanting to beat people up. It was usually very reactive. And I think Thomas Patera kind of idolised that and fantasised about himself in that position. So he wanted to be the person who, when bullies were coming to him, he could stand up for himself, he, he could defend himself, he can defend anybody around him. And I think it's important to note that Tommy, in and of himself, he really enjoyed movies just as a whole. Another movie to mention was called A Kiss of Death, and this was very um, foreshadowing. The movie was quite heavily revolving around uh, mafia, gang life and whatnot. And one of the main characters in this, Tommy Udo, obviously same name, that's something that apparently Tommy was really proud of, really happy for, but he was quite similar in the sense of he wouldn't go out looking for fights, he wouldn't go out seeking danger, but he lived for revenge. And spoilers if you're going to watch the movie. And basically somebody snitches on him or somebody snitches on his um, affiliates and he wants to get revenge on this person. So when he goes to this person's house, the mother's there, and one thing leads to another. The mother's pushed down the stairs and killed. And I don't think particularly Tommy wanted to go and kill people's mothers, but I think he enjoyed the fact that this character was wronged and he took his revenge in his own hands. Again, I'm not a psychoanalyst, I'm not qualified to make any links here and there, but I do think it's important to see that this young, innocent, diminutive um, victim of a child romanticised the idea that you can stand up to the people who are oppressing you, can stand up to the people who are pointing you out. And that's something that he really applied heavily into his martial arts. So as he was training from a very young age, his sensei, the people looking after him, the people teaching him, they could see that he was really, really talented. And obviously from the age of eight onwards, he's training, he's training, he's training. And this is something that he put his heart and soul into. He'd watch movies, he'd watch Bruce Lee in these movies, he'd try and emulate the stuff that Bruce Lee did, he'll play them out. And over time, he got competent enough to be able to um, stand up to his bullies. He, it wasn't so much a case of he was going around the school attacking them for the sake of, but he, bit by bit, he was slowly kind of um, e eking out his attackers bit by bit by bit because he knew how to stand up for himself. He, he wasn't on the level of Bruce Lee or anything at this point, but he... He wasn't as much of a victim anymore. As time went on, as Tommy got older, obviously as he got a lot more comfortable with the fighting styles, he started entering competitions in and around Brooklyn, in and around New York, and he was doing really well. He, he was actually winning most of these competitions, if not all. Um, I've, I've seen a few sources say that he won every single one of them, but a few sources said that he won most. I, I can't see the actual competitions within themselves that he entered. But it seems to be the general consensus that this guy really knew how to fight. So as Tommy was getting more renowned in the fighting scene, the martial arts scene within Brooklyn, within New York, um, with his peers, he entered a competition for Kumite, which is K-U-M-I-T-E. And this is basically a form of fighting. It, it, it translates to grappling hands. But basically, this competition was really difficult, really um, arduous, really testing of people's perseverance and Tommy actually won the competition itself and winning this competition was actually incredible for him because it landed him with a scholarship to go and study martial arts over in Japan so he instantly he was over there and he started studying under the tutelage of a uh, um, renowned world-renowned martial arts trainer called Hiroshi Masumi Tommy was here for 27 months and he was training all different kinds of styles. It was really grueling training, but he managed to fly through it. He was constantly, constantly, constantly training 
very little in the, in the means of breaks. And when he did have breaks, he was still trying to practice certain moves. He's actually been noted as one of the strongest students in, one, in this world-renowned master's um, teachings altogether. And obviously a big element of martial arts is how to use your hands, how to defend yourself, how to basically make yourself a weapon. But aside from that, Tommy also learned how to use the katanas, tomfas and gunchucks. These, these um, weapons that he'd seen on TV, that he'd been fascinated with, that he'd fantasized himself using, he's actually now becoming a master of these things. I'm not sure if he actually requested to be trained in these weapons or if it was part of the training regime. But either way, we know that after 27 months, Tommy Patera was pretty much this incredible, unstoppable fighting machine. He loved Japan so much, he wanted to stay there. He actually tried to get a job in a chopsticks factory, which didn't go very well for him, and he had to move back to Brooklyn not long after. But that, um, that job within itself, given the name of Tommy Karate, um, not the fact that he was this master of martial arts now, but the fact that he worked in a chopsticks factory. So coming back to New York, Tommy was like a whole new person. He'd actually grown his hair long to emulate his hero, Bruce Lee, whilst he was in Japan. This is something he kept for a little while whilst he was in New York. But ultimately, he was no longer the victim. He was no longer the person people will look to, the person people would come and um, attack or try and take advantage of because, f first of all, physically, he looked a lot more imposing. He he was ripped, he was muscly, he, he was confident, he was a lot more cultured. He just, holistically, it seemed as if where he went to be in this uh, New York child who had been bullied and s studied fighting to try and overcome the bullies, he was now just this general master, this this human weapon. And with this confidence, Tommy started going to a lot more bars in and around New York. He wasn't really worried about a brawl breaking out. He wasn't really worried about anybody mocking him for his voice or anybody pointing him out in any way whatsoever. The bars that Tommy went to were um, mafia owned. And two more or later, Tommy Patera actually crosses over this line from customer in these mafia owned bars to actually being a part of the mafia. He's got his stories, he's got his accolades. I mean, if I was in the Mafia, some high-ranking member, and I hear the stories about this guy who is a literal fighting machine, who's been over to Japan, he's studied all these exotic and incredible martial arts. He knows how to use certain weapons, he knows how to look after himself. He's basically a human form of a weapon. Of course you'd want him on your ranks. And not long after, Tommy was being sent out to job after job after job. And this obviously, at the start, it wasn't all these high-profile jobs because he was brand new. But it's important to note that he was being used quite a lot. It wasn't just so much for the fact that he was incredibly competent um, and everything he taught could be used for the Mafia's game. But it was the fact that he seemed to show no remorse whatsoever in when he was enacting what he needed to do. So he would attack people without even a moment's like a, a moment hesitation. Obviously not just anybody he'd attack who he's been ordered to attack, but he seemed to do it without any um, psychological pause, without, without anything to go, okay, with a, maybe I need to assess this. If he was told to attack somebody for a certain reason, he would attack them and he would brutally beat them. This obviously has taken a whole different level from what he grew up being obsessed with because the Bruce Lee characters, the characters in the shows that he watched, all these martial arts shows, um, or all, all these sort of underdogs, it was very much a case of they had to stand up for themselves, which Tommy initially did in martial arts, but now he's got to a point where he's got the abilities, he's got the skills, and he's been able to apply it to more nefarious ways. Just a really quick bit about the um, gangsters, about the mafia itself. Again, I don't want to go too much into this, but... Around here there was, um, from what I've read, five different crime families and obviously within those crime families there's infighting but there's also talks and whatnot. Um, generally what would happen here is the five heads of each family would meet up to discuss sort of, um, okay this area is mine, don't cross over it, or I need this job or let's start up a trade deal and obviously they discuss numbers, they'll discuss terms, they'll discuss um, all sorts of rules of what's going on. And the big thing to note was, say um, a certain crime boss or a certain one of the families had an issue 
and they had a lot of attention on those, like the authorities looking at them quite heavily, scrutinising everything that they did, they could get in contact with a uh, head of the family of another crime family to do the dirty work for them. One of the main people who would be sent on these missions, as it were, was Tommy Patera, and that's because even the other crime families had heard of this man, they'd heard of what he could do, they've heard of how vicious he was, how relentless, how brutal, how merciless. They knew that if Tommy Patera was on a case, it was going to be done, it was going to be done effectively. And this is where we start crossing into the more um, insidious side of Tommy Patera's nature, because when it got into killing, Tommy Patera was no amateur. So I don't want to talk about all the um, mafia deaths too much, because um, this would be a stupidly long video. And I want to focus more so on the deaths or the um, killings that are really important to the Tommy Patera case in and of itself. But ultimately, without asking many questions, without without really needing much, the Mafia knew that if Tommy Patera was sent to kill somebody, that person would just go. They would just disappear. Like, not, not even the case of, oh, he's dead. Like, the hit's been um, ticked off, we don't, we don't need to worry about it anymore. That person would just disappear and that was it. So of course this is an incredibly useful thing for the Mafia to have and it got to a point where even the other higher-ups within the... so Tommy was in the Bengano crime family, the other higher-ups within that family, the other higher-ups within all the other families, they were terrified of this guy. He could walk into a, a club and instantly there was whispers, oh, that's him, that's Tommy Patera, that's Tommy Karate, that's the butcher, as he was known later on. Um, because he'd been sent out on so many different cases and he'd done it with such um, precision, such clarity that, like, he had the respect. So it seemed as if Tommy Patera had completely flipped the table from not only being um, this sort of innocent, easy target, but now he was a literal fighting slash killer machine operating under the whims of the actual Mafia, which in and of itself is terrifying. By the time Tommy turned 30, he was pretty much a made man. Obviously it was in um, organised crime, so it's not the best way to be a made man, but he had no worries whatsoever. In regards to finances, he he had wealth, he, he had plenty of money, he had renown, he had respect. There was no way that anyone was going to challenge this guy. But because he was so well known, he was also getting a lot of attention from the police. But the incredible thing about this is this man was so intelligent. The way he would go about things was just so perfect, so meticulous, so so crafty that no matter how much he was watched, no matter what the police were trying to do to get this guy, not only the police, the DEA, the FBI, they were trying to get some sort of lead on this guy because they knew the name, they just couldn't link any of the um, deaths, any of the disappearances to him because he was so incredible and that's obviously why the Mafia liked him so much. The way Tommy would go about these killings was really weird. I, again, I don't want to focus too much on th these killings because, uh, and that's not me diluting the fact that he killed so many people, but just, I want to try and keep this video a lot more relevant so I don't go off on all these tangents like the last video. Um, but So what he'd do was he'd either be in a pub, he'd find a pub that was very dark lighting, very, you know, um, see the little pubs on the outskirts of certain towns. And most of the people who had a hit on them from the Mafia knew they were going to be attacked by the Mafia. Like, if you mess up in that lifestyle, you know that you've got something horrible coming to you. And what he did was he would go to these clubs where the lighting's a little bit darker, he would make, like, he'd sit in the corners and he'll obviously order drinks for this specific person he's trying to get a hit on, he'll watch them, he'll stalk them from afar. Um, and it's incredible to see how much went into this. It seemed to him almost a game. He was a predator, seek and prey, and that's something he thrived on. He really enjoyed the fact that he's been assigned a certain target, and he was going to get not only get that target, this target was going to evaporate. So he would, this all came out later on, but he would stalk the people he was supposed to be killing. He'll know the routine, he'll know the sort of bars they go to, and he'll kind of work his way into this routine. Two of the most notable things he did was He'll go into sort of the darker, more dimly lit bars, more seedy bars. He'd have drinks bought for the individual they're trying to attack. 
um, or or at least he would bribe the actual bartenders in advance and be like, okay, when this guy comes in, he's getting more alcohol on his drink. So this person they're trying to kill are a lot less in um, control of their faculties than they usually would be. And Tommy Patera will be sitting somewhere in the corner waiting for them to get to a point where he thinks it's they're sufficiently um, debilitated by the alcohol. And he'd approach dressed as a woman, so obviously he'd be completely clean shaven. He'd pass a lot more than Robert Durst would, the ugliest dry cream on the island, that was Robert Durst. Um, Tommy Patera was a lot more of a chameleon. He would he had the high-pitched voice, which worked in his favour, So, uh, but the person he was going to attack was already completely inebriated. Tommy Patera is sitting there in this dark light, high-pitched voice, wig, dress, whatnot, probably makeup. Um, he'd flirt with them, he'd chat them up, blah, blah, blah. Then he'd take them away and boom, dead, gone, disappeared. I'm going to get into how he actually made people disappear in a little while. Um, in just a moment, actually. But another thing he would do, which I think is just so bizarre, is he would dress up as an orthodox rabbi. And often he would kill people in this guise. He would literally go up to them. Like, he would wait until they go into certain rooms. He would wait until they go into certain buildings. Again, he's got their routine. He knows what they're doing. He's paid people off to be out of the room when he's there. And then he'd hit them. He, he, he'd take them out. So... With the money Tommy's getting from all these assassinations, with the money he's getting from his dealings with drugs, he, he himself never did drugs, he abhorred drugs and drug users, but he's getting the money from them, so of course he's going to keep selling to him. But with this money, he managed to buy three houses, and one of them was an apartment, one of them was quite a big stately house, and one of them was like a medium rung of the mill house, which he stayed in mostly. But the houses were used for different things. Um, and the two bars that he opened up, um, the names were Cypress Bar and Grill, and the other bar was called the Just Us Bar. Uh, the police were constantly trying to get in touch with me, like, they'd be like, okay, I've got this much of either marijuana, cocaine, heroin, whatever, to sell. Can you get me in touch with Tommy Patera so we can sort the deal out? And people were like, no, no, that's not how Tommy works. I can put you in touch with somebody who reports to Tommy, but there's no way you can go in there with Tommy. During this time, when he sort of in this prime, Tommy actually met and married a woman named Carol and had one child with her um, called Charles, Charles Patera, Charlie Patera. Um, but this marriage didn't quite work. T Tommy adored her, he really loved her, and he really loved his son. And even after the marriage broke apart, Tommy still looked out for them from a distance. This is something, he, he really respected women like to the umpteen degree, like they were they were goddesses to him. So even though obviously he wasn't directly involved in their life, he would still be in contact with them every now and then. He would make sure that they wanted for nothing. Obviously he's incredibly wealthy. Um, yeah, it's blood money, but still, if it's going to pay for rent, if it's going to pay for sustenance and whatnot, he's obviously going to um, put that towards his ex-wife and his child. Like he, he just, he loved that family unit so much. Even if he knew he wasn't exactly directly a part of it anymore, and even then, he respected that distance. But not long after this, um, not, not too short after either, like there was some time, Tommy met somebody called Celeste Lapari, and she was involved in the same sort of circles as Tommy. She was um, a part of a mafia lifestyle. Her family were part of mafia lifestyle. She was well known. Um, and Tommy fell for her. He fell for her hard. And just like Carol, he had... Uh, adored this woman. He really fell for her. One thing that Tommy and Celeste never agreed on was the fact that she was a very heavy drug user. I said before that Tommy abhorred drug users. He hated it so much, but his love for Celeste kind of outweighed that um, detest for drug users. But it wasn't enough for him to just let it slide by. He would argue with Celeste all the time about how heavily she was using drugs. And um, not only was she using drugs heavily, like it was ridiculous and it was a cocktail of drugs so Celeste and her best friend who's called Phyllis Birdie they would be out every single night they'll be doing what they'd be drinking endlessly then they do cocaine for a high but then to wind down they usually go back to one of their apartments or to somebody's apartment and they'll take heroin as kind of a soother a karma and it just caused so many arguments. Like Tommy was constantly saying, if you carry on, I will leave you. And Celeste would usually say, oh yeah, it's fine, no, don't worry, I'll stop, I'll stop. But then 
Tommy would go about his business and he'd hear that Celeste was out again with Phyllis Birdie doing these drugs. Tommy was getting really wound up at the fact that he was telling, because everyone's terrified of this guy. If he says to do something, they would do it in a heartbeat. But Celeste wouldn't do it. She, she didn't listen to him. So Tommy seemingly unable to, I don't want to say control Celeste, because I think that's a very fair ask not to take drugs consistently. But again, his character isn't exactly ideal either. So it's a bit strange. Like she could be saying, okay, well, get out of life of crime then. Um, but either way, the fact that he couldn't kind of sway her into um, kicking the habit really frustrated him. Tommy's general view on drugs was, you control the drugs, they don't control you. And obviously his wife is using constantly with this Phyllis Birdie. So he ends up setting a meeting for Phyllis Birdie after realising that there's not much he can do to take Celeste away from the drugs or take the drugs away from Celeste. And he said, I've got the quote here. I have a problem, I need your help. Celeste's drug habit is out of control. I'm not blaming you for anything. I'm not saying you did anything. All I'm saying is she can't control herself. And I'd really appreciate it if you made sure not to give her any drugs. Tommy just said to her, look, if, it, if things don't change, it won't end well for you. And again, Phyllis didn't really take this as a, a token of ill omen. She was like, okay, well, it's not me giving her the drugs. If I go out and Celeste is there, we'll go and meet up. We'll, like, I'm going to use my drugs that I've got from my own source. I can't stop Celeste from getting drugs from her source. Because, and I can't tell Celeste no because I'm doing them myself. So she was very much like a, well, he can't blame me because it's not my fault. She's getting them elsewhere. She's going to do them regardless. She may as well do them with me. Obviously, that's not ideal. But Tommy, again, he respected women so much. He wasn't going to do anything bad. He wasn't going to force anything. He'd, he'd set the threat. And at this point, Tommy is pretty much the most renowned killer in the Bomano crime family, in this uh, group of um, crime families. So I want to talk a little bit about the killings now. Tommy, as a killer, was, as I said, he was in incredible he would be able to stalk down the person he's supposed to be killing no matter how dangerous no matter how elusive they were he would get them he would kill them and he would dismember their bodies so the way he would do it is obviously usually he would shoot them so much like the robert dest um killing susan berman case um she was shot in the back of the head with obviously uh, a mafia style execution and that rings true here that's generally what Tommy would do he would shoot people straight in the head um not always from the back sometimes from the front but just boom 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 dead and then once they were dead he would drag them to a bathtub he would lay them in there he himself would get naked but not a, not a rough okay get naked let's do this he would obviously they're in the bathtub he would take his clothes off he'll fold them neatly all aside and then he would get to work. He had his own little toolkit. So the toolkit he had was supposed to be used for autopsies, obviously, to discover what happened to a body and to get into places we'd rather keep um, compact and closed. But Tommy would get into the bathtub with them and he would just start severing away. He'd sever the, each leg, each arm, obviously, and then the head. So... The body was in six parts completely. There was four limbs, which obviously are the two legs, the two arms, the torso and the head. Again, he's a very capable man. He would then pack this up. Usually before he actually did this, he would make sure that there was nobody tailing him or if people were tailing him, he'd do it a different day or he'd make sure he lost them. But what he'd do is he'd bring them to um, a bird sanctuary on Staten Island. And this bird sanctuary was so ridiculous it was protected by the government so nobody was supposed to be on here nobody was supposed to be able to gain access to here but this was tommy's personal burial ground and what he'd do was he would dig up the grave so deep so usually the hole for a grave is supposed to be around six foot before you lay them to rest um but tommy would dig double that at least like he would go so deep that if anybody was to for some reason stumble on this Staten island they like they wouldn't just happen across, the, there would be no change in the soil. And to assist that, Tommy would wrap their body up in plastic and then put those in sort of cheap suitcases, cheap cases. So they were doubly compact and then bury them deep, 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 deep down. And even the ones that he didn't sort of take as much care with, which was pretty much most of them, 
the soil that he buried in anyway was moist which would act as a catalyst to the decomposition process so he knew what he was doing he wasn't just this um just this random oh uh, spare of the moment i want to kill somebody i'm gonna lash their body somewhere like most of the killers like most of the serial killers are he was prolific he was he, he was expert and what he'd also do was take the head away obviously like um break the teeth remove the teeth or just get rid of the head altogether so even if Say a whole team has to come up to this island to try and find these bodies. The sniffer dogs couldn't find anything because the bodies are in suitcases and the plastic wrapped and they're so far underground. And uh, hopefully, well, oh my gosh, well, hopefully. And for him, the bodies would have decomposed by the time that they're found, if they're ever found. And even then, when the body parts are recovered, they couldn't be identified as any individual person because the dental records couldn't link them. So even if the bodies are found, there's no way that they could be linked to any disappearances whatsoever, which is just a whole other level of sadistic. And the reason, again, Tommy is on this case, obviously he's a killer, like that is what he is, but he would start taking totems. So a totem is basically when a serial killer um, obviously kills somebody, they take little items here and there as a token to remember this killing by. It would sometimes be like, like you know, um, a coin, a wallet, a watch, that sort of stuff. But in some cases, Tommy had fingers. Obviously, they were bones by this point. But um, yeah, finger bones. He had um, certain like locks of hair. He would have all these different things that would remind him of the killing. And that's where you get into the territory. That's really sort of he wasn't doing this for a job. It wasn't just effective murder in regards to the benefit of the Mafia. This was something he was just incredibly good at, he enjoyed to do, and he just found a way to get paid for it. So his method and how meticulous he was with these deaths got him um, a really good reputation and the interest of the Mafia boss, um, Joe the Gentleman. Now, Joe the Gentleman was called this because he, he was Again, there's a lot of stuff that have happened in the Mafia side of things, which I don't want to get into. But basically, there's been sort of uprising and mutiny and the certain deaths with other heads of the bosses. And then there's been eyes and agreements until a certain point. But basically, there's this um, Mafia leader called Joe the Gentleman, who's this very suave, very well-dressed, very polite, very sweet, and has this all other side to him. That's just this awful, terrible, malicious, um, organised crime element. So this Joe the Gentleman, um, he wanted to snitch dead. Basically, someone snitched against his family, against something that they did, and he wanted them dead. Tony Patera wanted to be the person who goes after him, but Joe the Gentleman, even though he respected Tony Patera, he didn't know him well enough, he didn't know him personally. So Joe the Gentleman went for another hitman. And his orders for this hitman was, get the snitch, take him out, bury him deep which is Tommy Patera's like staple, that's what people knew him for, he, he, that's what he did anyway, he didn't need to be told, that was his method anyway, but no, somebody else was asked, kill this guy, bury him deep, and that person did kill this guy, but they didn't bury him deep, they left him in an oil tank, that's not what he wanted, he wanted this person to disappear, so he was furious, he was not happy at all that this person gave direct orders to didn't carry them out to the to the letter so he went to Tommy Patera and he put a hit out on the guy who enacted the first hit so what Tommy did to kill this other killer was he lured him to uh, some abandoned factory already I know warm and bells red flag and whatnot but this is kind of how they operated and as far as this guy knew Joe the gentleman had thanked him he's like thank you for your job I really appreciate it. you got rid of the snitch for us so he didn't realise that he was in the crosshair of Joe the Gentleman. So Tommy led him to a warehouse um, under the pretense of um, setting up a drug trade. Obviously, you need to be under the radar. You can't let other people know. This guy came along and Tommy straight away just shot dead. Boom, 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 dead. And then went and did his um, routine of dismembering the body into six separate parts. And what he'd do as well is when they're in the bathtub, he'd set the water to a certain flow. So the blood would go with the water without staining anywhere. Um, obviously, there's a whole cleanup team and stuff involved anyway. But Tommy wants to make sure that everything was sorted. As as you know, it was just very clean cut killing. 
sorry, wrong terminology, but you know what I mean, it was just very, um, very precise. So he did what he needed to do, he got rid of the body, he buried deep, <laughs> deep, 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 which Joe the Gentleman was very thankful for. But to tell me this wasn't a, I'm, do I'm doing this for you, so pay me. It was an honour to be asked to kill somebody for this guy, and Tommy did it. So he just curried favour with one of the most influential people in New York, which to him was probably the highlight of his career. Like, he'd already obviously got the houses, got the bars, got the money. Like, he, he, he didn't need to worry about anything. But now he just, like, it, I guess it's priceless. If the head of a mafia owes you a favour, then, like, you can pray and pray and pray for anything. And the mafia bosses be the one who would do it for you. Like, that is incredible for him in this world. But as Tommy's gone about all these businesses, all these sort of... Um, drug deals and attacks and killings he kind of takes under his wing this guy called Frank Ganji or Frank Gangi I think it's called Frank Ganji um, and basically Frank Ganji was somebody who was in need of a lot of money he needed to pay certain people back and he didn't have the wherewithal to do it so he was asking around and people were like oh Tommy Patera he's loaded he's well known and he's got the ring out so go to him ask him for money he should be able to help you out but Tommy basically said to him, I'm not a lender. I don't give people money and expect it back because that's not my style of business. But what we can do is you work for me. We will set up this um, business model where you sell drugs on my behalf. I get money. You get money. You can pay the people back in time. Let them know that you're working for me. I'm sure they'll be able to work around it. Um, and we're both happy. And this is something that Frank did. And Frank and Tommy got really close. They were pretty much like, they were very, very close friends. But obviously this is the mafia and trust is a massive thing. So um, even though he, Tommy really liked him and wanted to bring him further in to the mafia, um, he had to test people. So the test that Tommy gave to Frank was there was this individual called Talal Sikh Sikh. Talal Sikh Sikh, he was a part of um, a, a different organized crime. So here, obviously you got the five, um, sort of main mafias, but there's obviously all sorts of ne'er-do-wells about. And Talal Sikh Sikh belonged to one of these, and he'd actually been pointed out as a rat. And uh, again, Tommy Patera despised rats, but that's something that just generally um, accepted across mafias. Like, if you rat, you are the lowest of the low. He was actually being held in some warehouse by two guys who were obviously part of Tommy's um, affiliations. And... Tommy brought Frank along with him. So Frank had been involved in murders before, but that was usually very like in the moment, chaotic, or oh, bang and bang, let's get this auto over and done with kind of thing. He'd never been to anything of this level where, okay, we are going here to kill. Killing was usually like uh, something that happened alongside the main goal. So Fr uh, Tommy brought Frank to this warehouse. He walked in where Talal Sikh Sikh was sitting tied up and he was clearly battered like he'd been beaten to within an inch of his life and it said that Tommy without a word without hesitation walked up and just shot Talal Sikh Sikh three times in the head just bang 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 dead and then he obviously goes about his business he tells Frank to come with him to this bathroom he brings the body through and then obviously they're in there he says to Frank get naked so Frank is literally terrified he's never seen someone shot he's never seen someone killed so callously so heartlessly and frank described tommy as a living breathing monster this is coming from somebody who's worked within the mafia so he's actually terrified of this tommy patera guy who's took him under his wing who's really um took a, a liking to him so he said to him so tommy said to frank get naked get in the bathtub with the body so frank okay all tremulous gingerly get in the bathtub Tommy gives him the toolkit, like, dismember, here, 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 here. Um, it's obviously, Tommy was an expert at dismembering people, but Frank had never done it before. So Frank is sitting in this bathtub with this dead body, um, freshly dead body, with a hacksaw being ordered to cut it into six parts. And he just can't do it. He, he cannot bring himself to dismember this body apparently an argument broke out where the two were going on and on and at each other and Frank obviously Frank's terrified of this person but he just cannot bring himself to physically go ahead and dismember this man so Tommy after a while he's like okay Tommy again 
gets naked, takes his, takes his clothes off, puts it neatly, and Frank gets out of the bathtub. Tommy gets in. And Tommy makes Frank watch him do the whole process. So they dismember, he does the water, he gets the body obviously all wrapped up in the suitcases, and he gets the team to sort it. And Frank's terrified, and he knows that he disappointed Tommy, but nothing's really said about it, after, obviously after the body's been disposed of and made to disappear. That's kind of left. So Frank's obviously a little bit anxious, but again, nothing really gets done about it. Tommy brings him out on more cases, there's more killings. Um, I think overall there's a, a f there's five killings that are around for Frank and Tommy. And even though Frank goes along with these killings, um, he is just traumatised by what he's seeing. He took to, he was drinking a bottle of whiskey, two bottles of whiskey per day, just to be able to get through. And he also started to turn to cocaine. One of the people he would do cocaine with a lot was Phyllis Birdie. Phyllis Birdie is the one who is less friends, the one that Tommy Patera threatened. And Frank knew that there was some tension there, so he didn't tell Tommy Patera. And also, he knew that him being a user wasn't a good thing for him to be when working with the Mafia. So Phyllis kept it to herself, and um, Frank obviously kept it to himself. But the only way he could pretty much process life and move forward was by being so wasted and getting so high and then he found this sort of strange um codependency on phyllis birdie the two of them would get high they would go home and have um sort of drug fueled sex and this is something that really thrilled frank because it was something that could take his mind off the horrors that he'd just seen or the horrors that were sort of like in the forefront of his mind constantly every time he blinked every time he dreamt he'd thought of this dismemberment so this woman was kind of a beacon of um a, a beacon of bliss for him when he was with her he was so out of his mind and he was focusing on pure hedonism he didn't need to think about that sort of stuff so obviously frank's getting quite heavily on the drugs and um phyllis she's still doing what she does best she's having that part life. she's living that lifestyle and even though things are a little bit contentious with tommy and frank he's still obviously very loyal to tommy he's terrified of tommy he's still going out on all these deals with tommy and tommy separately keeps hearing these reports that celeste is still out doing what she's doing and he's furious so tommy is fuming about this and he's he, he's like he's venting with frank and he's saying, I've told Phyllis this, I've told Phyllis that. So he know Tommy knows that Frank knows who Phyllis is. They just he just doesn't know their connection. So he's saying, Okay, I need to do something to Phyllis because Celeste is still going out, taking cocaine, taking heroin, and she's doing it with that bitch Phyllis. So Frank is obviously like, Oh no, no, wait, 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 okay, do you know what? Like, maybe let me talk to her. So Tommy's like, Okay, thanks, mate, you go and do that. And Frank goes to speak Frank goes to speak to Phyllis, and he's saying to her, Listen. This guy is not to be trifled with. He's already told Phyllis exactly what he saw and how terrified he is of Tommy, but Phyllis doesn't care. Again, she's part of that lifestyle. She's like, what are you going to do? He's going to attack me. I'm literally one of the like, mob. I'm literally in the mob myself. I know in the mob. If he attacks me, he's going to be attacked. Like She felt pretty much invulnerable, as well as the fact that Tommy was well known for never wanting to um, hurt any women. So she's just saying, she's being as um, as petulant to Frank as she was to Tommy. And stupidly enough, even though Frank knew that Tommy was looking to really, like, again, he wasn't looking to kill Phyllis, but he was looking to severely damage her. He, she, she was on his on his negative side, um, which is not a good place to be with Tommy Patera. But even though Frank knew this, and Frank knew that if Tommy found out about their relationship together, the fact that Tommy, the fact that Frank had told Phyllis about the stuff that Tommy did, the fact that Frank was sort of involved sexually with Phyllis, that would be awful for him. And not only the fact that he was doing it, like the fact that he was doing it behind Tommy's back, he knew that wouldn't um, do well. But regardless, that night when to when Frank warned Phyllis, he went back to her. He went back to her house, and they went ahead and did what they would do best. They took cocaine, they had sex, and they do all sorts that Frank just really enjoyed because he could just lose himself in the pleasure. So not long after Frank had warned Phyllis about Tommy's intentions, the 
two of them, Phyllis and Celeste, those two, were out on another on another night out. They were again had their drinks at the start, took the cocaine to really enjoy the buzz of the night out, and then later went back to the apartment with a few others, and they all started taking heroin. Again, I'm not taking heroin. I don't know the ins and outs of um, drug use, but what I know is. Um, when with any drug there's a purity level and the higher the purity the more dangerous drugs can be um obviously you need to balance it out well, i say obviously i assume you need to balance it out to get this perfect level of um the drugs are potent enough to give your body some sort of reaction but not kill you but either way um the way they were taking the heroin on this night is they were streamlining it basically you put it straight into your vein it goes straight into your blood system and it's kind of this instant reaction your body will re respond to it automatically um so there's this party there's this drug fuel party where they're all taking drugs they've had the cocaine they've had their night out they're coming back to sort of chill and and have whatever fun they wanted to have and celeste is one of the people doing this with phyllis and this this group of people so celeste main lines the heroin but this heroin was incredibly pure and ultimately Celeste passes out and doesn't wake up. And because everybody else is so drugged, so wasted, nobody knows that Celeste is dead in the house. The next day they wake up and they find Celeste dead. The police are called and it's so infuriating because there's a likelihood she may have um, pulled through if the ambulance were called in advance, which obviously isn't great in, in any circumstance not great but because of who was in love with her it's going to cause a lot of commotion down the line so the police are there and what the one of the officers there actually knows tommy like a, a lot of the people here are very um corrupt and they'll take bribes and they'll take payments here and there so even though the police are trying to work a way into getting into sort of tommy's inside circle a lot of the police are actually already in tommy's inside circle on the other way around so this police officer says to Tommy, look, this is what's happened. Tommy shows up, but Frank's already been told about what's happened as well. So Frank's also in this other person's apartment. Tommy's there and apparently he went crazy. As in like, not not like just angry, like he was sobbing, he was heaving over the, he was heaving over the body. He was like cupped hands, shaking, he didn't know what to do. He was punching walls, he was um, pacing up and down, just outburst of anger and then and then tragedy and then all this like this massive whirlwind of emotions and as he's going through this and frank's trying to calm him down they've got other people in the apartment like all sorts of officials he sees phyllis bear he leave the bathroom and when he sees phyllis bear he instantly put it together he's like this is you i'm going to kill you so he tries to run to phyllis to kill her and it takes a few people to stop tommy and the police officer literally says to tommy you can't do that with me here. You know you can't do that. So Tommy leaves Phyllis with that last, I'm going to get you for this, and heads home. And as he's heading home, Frank's coming with him to calm him down, to placate him. Obviously, Frank's got ulterior motives here. His sort of, I guess, girlfriend at this point has just been threatened by the one guy he's actually terrified of. So as Tommy's in the apartment, He's he's furious. He's seeing them. Obviously, he's heartbroken. He's he's grieving. He's he's just dealing with all this. And what he says is basically, obviously, he knows if he kills Phyllis, it's going to be linked directly to him. So what he does is he orders Frank to go and kill her. He's got no idea of this history of Frank and Phyllis. He's got no idea that because of what he did, Frank's turned to drugs. He's turned to drink. He's turned to Phyllis to try and just get through. Phyllis knows that she is in trouble. So she goes into hiding in a sense, but she doesn't really disappear. She's still around. She's still in New York. She's still in Brooklyn, but she's not really in the same haunts as she used to be. She's not really um, as high profile as she used to be. She is keeping quiet to a point where even Frank, the person she's involved with, doesn't see her. He can't get in touch with her. She obviously knows that Frank and Tommy are very close. So I'm not sure if she's trying to lay low just in case he tries to attack her or tries to kill her like she like he's being ordered to. But either way, Frank is actually looking for her and Tommy is 
constant on this. He, he's irate about it. He's persistent. Have you found her? Have you found her? Have you found her? He's trying to get in touch with all the drug dealers around Brooklyn. He's trying to get in touch with anybody who could have any link to Phyllis and saying, if you find her, let me know. I will kill her myself. Just let me know. Unfortunately for Phyllis, um, Frank actually did find her. He just he just ran into her casually. Um, well, not casually. He just ran into her sort of through circumstance. And instantly he's like, Phyllis, Phyllis, look, like, come with me. I need to speak to you. She's obviously a little bit, a little bit cautious, a little bit tensive. She's like, oh, well, no, because you might stab me. But she goes obviously along with him. She's got the trust there. If this was, if they didn't have that history, then obviously she would back away. She'd be like, no, obviously, like, absolutely not. But because they do have this connection, she goes with him. And Frank is saying to her, he, he's going to kill you. You like, leave, leave New York, leave, leave America. Just go, just disappear. Just please go. But she's, she's still steadfast saying, I wasn't the one giving the drugs. It wasn't down to me. She's hiding, obviously, because she knows that Tommy's after her. But maybe things are going to die down after he calms down about it. But either way, Frank is persistently trying to say, no, no, look, you don't understand. This is, this is your death if you don't leave now. And she doesn't. And for some reason... And again, I, I don't I don't get what goes through these people's minds sometimes. I, I guess, I don't know, I just take over or whatnot. And obviously Frank's still traumatised by everything that he's seen. And there's been other deaths and other murders and other... Um, he's participated in other stuff with Tommy Patera at this point. But he, he takes Phyllis back to his apartment and they start doing drugs. They're doing cocaine, they're doing heroin, they're doing all sorts. And they do it well into the night. So the whole night is full of just drugs and sex up until early morning, which they only stop because they run out of drugs. That's the only reason they stop. So what Frank does is rather than fall asleep or go, okay, fellas, you need to go, they get in touch with a, a drug dealer that they know. And obviously, even though people are terrified of Tony Patera, there's obviously also circles who were loyal to each other. Phyllis and Frank go to this drug dealer's house and they're like, okay, Here's the mummy, here's the drugs, go away. So the drug dealer goes away and leaves these to do their own thing. And um, they're having more sex, having more drugs, taking more drugs until finally Phyllis passes out. She's just asleep, she's gone. And Frank's sitting there like, like what do I do? What do I do? Like, like I've literally got her here. She, she won't go. Tommy wants her dead. He's constantly asking me, have you killed her yet? Have you killed her yet? Have you found her yet? He's looking around everywhere. And while Frank's in this apartment with Phyllis in the room, the phone rings. This guy, this guy's obviously a drug dealer. His phone's going to ring a lot. Frank picks up the phone to be like, oh, he's not here. And he hears Tommy Patera on the phone. Tommy Patera's calling around the drug dealers as he has been looking for anyone who's had any connection with Phyllis. So Tommy Patera is on the other side of the phone. He's like, Frank, what are you doing there? And Frank, maybe out of panic, Maybe because he's like, there's no way out of this, just says, you'll never guess who's here with me. Tommy's like, who? What, what are you talking about? He's like, Phyllis Birdie is in this other room asleep. And Tommy's like, is she there right now in that other room you're saying? He's like, yep, she's here now. He's like, keep her there. Whatever you do, she does not leave that building. She does not go. You keep her in there no matter what. So Frank's like, okay. And instead of going to wake her up, like they could have staged something where he was overpowered or whatnot. Um, you know, he leaves her there, Tommy goes home, he gets his pistol, he gets his killer paraphernalia stuff together, and then he goes to, to this drug dealer's house, and he sees Frank, and he's like, where is she? And Frank's like, she's in that room. Obviously, there must be, like, this flurry of emotions going on through Frank. He's just not long had a full night, a, a full night and morning of drug fueled sex with this woman. He has feelings for this woman. He's looked at this woman a lot for some sort of sanity, for some sort of solace, and he's just basically ordered her execution. So Tommy goes in there and straight away, no hesitation, no thought, much like the Talal Seek Seek and probably every other murder that um, Tommy Patera has been involved with, just shoots her dead. Boom, boom, boom. That's her life over and done with. That obviously is heartbreaking because she wasn't really to blame for Celeste's death. Like, yeah, she was there on the day it happened, and yet yeah, there, there, there is sort of impartial blame there, in a sense, if she could have done more to try and like, sort of take away Celeste's um, want to do, take away Celeste's temptation to want to do drugs, 
um, but she didn't. But again, there was a lot of other people who were involved in this, and Celeste obviously would get drugged up with a few other people. It was just that because Phyllis and Celeste were best friends, she was the one going, who was taking the br she was the one who was taking the brunt of all the blame, which I understand, but that is incredibly unfair. So she's just been killed, and then Tommy goes about his business. He takes her to the bathroom while Frank's just sitting in the other room, just like panicked and going through his head, think like trying to just come to terms with what's just happened. So this apartment didn't have a bathtub, but it did have this oversized jacuzzi. Of course it did. So already Tommy's brought the corpse in there as Frank's in the other room, just panic and just stressing over the fact that his girlfriend, for lack of a better word, has just been killed. Somebody just spent the night with somebody he'd been looking for, somebody who he's looked to for a lot of help has just been shot dead and is currently in this oversized jacuzzi being taken care of the way he's seen other mafia members being taken care of. As Tommy's working on this and Frank's kind of having this panic attack, Frank is called into this um, bathroom and Tommy is only part way through the dismemberment process. So he's actually dismembered the head, so he severed her head and he severed her arms. And it's said that when Frank walked in, her head was staring towards him with one eye open, one eye closed, which is just like, I, I can't even imagine what that must feel like. Again, if that was just a, a dead body, if that, that was like an enemy of Frank, even that gruesome sight is enough to, like just saying it is enough to make me go, oh, like just, just cringe a little. But this was somebody he, I, I guess, loved. They were together. Okay, not a sort of conventional relationship, but what is a conventional relationship? And now she's being dismembered in the hands of somebody who he's terrified of. So as Tommy is going about this, he starts speaking to Frank very casually about the bullets he used. And the bullets he used were called glacial rounds. And these bullets are, the way they're designed generally is for maximum damage of the human body. So the way the bullet works is it goes, so say the bullet goes in, towards the body as soon as it hits impact there it penetrates through and then shatters and like sort of and fractures into a, a loads of tiny pieces so with inside the body there's just a, a an area of effect it's just this blast of shrapnel going inside you so obviously i, I guess you could couldn't feel it because tommy just shot it dead straight away but as he's explaining this, he shoots Phyllis's torso three times again, just boom, boom, boom. As he's just explaining what these bullets do, I just, I just can't imagine what Frank must have been feeling at this moment. And again, Tommy obviously dismembers the body. He gets, does what he needs to do with it. And he brings it to Staten Island to do what he's doing. And Frank's just left, Frank doesn't need to come along to this. Frank goes. And Frank is so shaken up, like he is distraught, like he is a broken man. He was already terrified of Tommy, he's already distraught by the stuff he's seen, but by this point, he's just he like he's completely just I I he's completely just destroyed. Okay, there's two reports that um kind of come up with what happened? So Phyllis's body has been buried in the usual place in the, in the burial ground and whatnot, but her head is taken away. Tommy usually takes the heads away anyway. The reports that I've kind of sort of followed that are a bit more um, involved, who would have more of an understanding of what happened, or like one of them actually um, is involved in the mafia themselves, um, and again, not, not a rat, it's just sort of like, um, they're just speaking about what's happened. Um, they say that Tommy Patera had Phyllis's head in the fridge so he could see it as his finest trophy of the perfect revenge. Every time he opened the fridge door, he would see Phyllis's head right there. And obviously because it's in the fridge, it decomposed slower. Um, which, it is true, is so messed up. But also not very surprising because even when Tommy had no direct link to the person he killed, he would still take a totem. He would still take something to remember the death by. But ultimately, Phyllis was killed amongst these other 
apparently it's up to 60 people that Tommy killed. So the way it all kind of um, comes to a close is Frank is destroyed by this. He truly is like, he's doing whatever he can to stay away from Tommy. He's generally like, he's he, obviously he knows he can't run away from Tommy because Tommy will kill him. But ultimately he's, he's trying his hardest to stay away from anything involved in this lifestyle. But again, when Tommy does get in touch with them, he has to he has to obey. He is obedient. This is probably due more to terror than anything else. But Frank knows obviously he can't escape this guy. And if he tries to, he's going to be chased down. But because he is so destroyed, like he's drinking more than anybody possibly um could or should. Um I guess a lot of people say that they think he was trying to drink himself into a death. But what happened was Frank is driving whilst completely wasted and he's pulled over by the police. They take they, they take him in to a cell to hold overnight and it's not even so much a case they go to arrest him. Obviously there's going to be charges and whatnot because of what he's done and the, the state he was driving in. But while he's in this holding cell waiting for him to sober up, he's over the night, he's he's just stressing, he's thinking, I need to get out of this life. This like I'm a broken man. What he does is he asks to speak with one of the detectives and apparently the detective that night was just about to head home and he's saying, um, wait until tomorrow, he can speak to me tomorrow until the name Tommy Patera was mentioned. Obviously, all these people have been trying to get Tommy Patera this whole time and not one of them was successful and Tommy was too smart, too intelligent, too um, crafty to be caught. Again, in the Mafia, what they'll do is every three days or so, the... Um, mob members will have a different car and as that car's sort of being taken either painted stripped completely realigned new license plate so it's like a whole new car they'll already be in this separate car like there's this constant um revolving doors of different cars different houses different places that they go to so it's very difficult for the um authorities to keep any sort of routine or to keep any tabs on them this, this was back before technology is to the level that it is now so it wasn't so easy to try and sort of like bug places or to keep tabs or to monitor things as as is possible now so after all this time of tommy being elusive and getting away with all these murders and all these deaths and even though they knew full well that this guy was a killer that he was a dealer they can never actually bring him to justice frank tells them everything and not even just about Phyllis he tells them about Talal Sikhsi he tells them about all the other cases he's been on with um Tommy he tells them he tells literally everything the police wanted to know Frank's got the insider information he's he just spilled everything I, I don't think he spilled everything on the mafia as a whole but everything linked to Tommy Patera he told them and apparently after he gets everything off his chest Frank becomes a lot calmer he's like a lot more softly spoken he's a lot more relaxed he's finally just released all this stress all this pressure all this hardship that he's been carrying with him for so long so ultimately this is enough for Tommy Patera to be taken in but they need to be careful because obviously it's Tommy Patera Frank basically is sent to Pennsylvania um for witness protection he's there he's safe there's 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 no way anyone could get to him where he's being held which Tommy notices quite quickly. He's like, okay, there's something not quite right about this. Frank isn't answering my calls. He's not in his apartment. He's not responding to me. Like, none of my contacts can be in touch with him. Something's not right. And Tommy being as switched on as he is, he's like, he's he's snitched. He's, he's done the worst thing anybody in this position could do. So Tommy goes to Frank's family's house. And they're like, oh, we don't know. Like, we know he's gone out of the state for a while, but we don't know why. So if Tommy is, by this point, he's like, okay, that's a mentative forum. That's what's happened. So Tommy Lee is trying to figure out, trying to get information. He's, he's like, okay, spread the word. We need to find Frank Gangi. Frank, Frank Gangi. We need to find him. We need to know what's happening because he's snitched. He's ratted. We need to get this man. And that day, the police, the authorities go to Frank's family and they also remove them as well. They take them to witness protection, which is a good thing because that night, Tommy was going to go back to Frank's house and take the family as sort of kidnap them as leverage for Frank to come out of hiding. So now Tommy has no leverage over this, except for the fact that every single person within the crime 
family like not even so the main mafia houses just everybody who's involved in organized crime are looking for this guy like he he could have not stepped foot in anywhere in new york city without being seen by somebody from here so it was lucky he was in pennsylvania but not even that the network that the Fran family could extend to was so extensive that it was reaching other states all these people in this sort of underground business were looking for this guy and as that's going on the police have everything they need to catch Tommy Patera. And Tommy Patera knows this, so he's really laying low. The way they get him is just so ridiculous. So basically, Tommy, as I said before, he'd be from a distance looked after his um, ex-wife, Carol, and the kid, Charles. And he's obviously stopped off there. He's dropped off wherever he needs to drop off. And he's driving back. He's just listening to music. He's just chilling. He's doing his own thing. And then he's basically gridlocked in traffic at a time the police see him this detective this this agent sees him so what they do is they run over to tommy's car as he's stuck in traffic and they basically have got the gun to the car saying get out get on the ground right now both of them they're literally going right on tommy and tommy being tommy what he does is he instead of going okay you got me here he dives out the other passenger seat he dives through it and he starts running that there's a chase that goes on for a little while and sooner or later they've been caught up with and the way the way he's caught is Tommy falls face down into the asphalt so he fully takes the um head there and in that moment because he, he's been fighting like obviously chasing getting caught fighting chasing again in that moment where he hits the floor and he's kind of stunned for a moment they handcuff him and then he's taken away that ultimately wraps up this case of um, Tommy Patera. I know it's a strange one because technically he killed via the mafia, but the reason it piqued my interest is because it, it seemed like the mafia killing was just uh, a way to get paid for it. It's something he liked to do. He's in jail now, he's in jail for life, and he's being charged with six murders. So um, yeah, he's serving um, life in prison at the moment. And apparently while he's in prison, he's reading a lot of books, he's responding to a lot of mail, he's he's still quite influential in the um, crime families, but obviously he's behind bars. He's, in this whole time, he's not ratted on any of the other mafia members, which is, they all respect him for, he's literally not said it. So they've got nothing from him, they try to cut his time down, and they've offered him all sorts of privileges to say, okay, if you tell us this about this member of the family, or if you tell us something that we can use that will lead to an arrest, we will make things a lot easier for you. Somebody said no. And when they arrest him, they raided his apartments. In the apartments, uh, I think it was the smallest apartment, they found all books on how to, on like the sort of effective ways to kill, all martial arts book, and books on sort of um, dismemberment, books on autopsy, like the way to really sort of deconstruct the body in the cleanest way possible. So this shows that Tommy wasn't just a, a, a career killer. He he found this fascinating. He, he did study and research into this he really enjoyed what he was doing which is so disgusting um frank ganji for oh, frank Gangi, this frank guy is again still alive um apparently he still lives very much under a new name he lives away from everything but a lot of this era has died down so he is known by some people but nobody's really gone out to hit him anymore apparently um he did get time in prison for taking part in these killings and he also um, asked for a reduction of the case, which was refused because he he did these things. And it seemed to a lot of the people there, including the judge, including the jury, that he was doing this, one, because his girlfriend died, and two, because he was fearing for his life. That's why he ratted out. Um, but, yeah, he's still alive. He actually, there's a book about um, this whole thing. I can't remember what it's called. I'll put it up on screen so you can um, order it if you want to. But he actually spoke to the author of this book. A lot of the information that I've been given has come from this book. Um, a lot of the information that the book was based on with what from Frank's told him. But yeah, as it stands, Tommy is in jail and Frank is out now. Okay, so ultimately that's that case over and done with. Um, it's a bit more streamlined, although I'm still getting used to how to actually deliver these cases in a more coherent way. Like chronologically it doesn't really work to say okay from this point to this point I try and stick with um, chronology as much as I can but there's certain things like say I want to talk about the fact that 
when Tommy was just member and bodies, he'd studied this, but that happened later on. So I can't say too much because I said that then you know his apartment's been raided, so you know he's been arrested. Um, obviously, it's not a case that I want to increase the suspense because it's not a sort of a thrilling story that I'm trying to tell you in a sense to like um, get some sort of reaction. I just want to sort of deliver the story as best as I can, but in a way that's interesting for you to actually receive it. So thank you so much for being so um, understanding and so supportive with the previous video. Hopefully I'll get the same reaction with this video. Hopefully you've seen some improvement. Um, as I said last time, what I do sort of, and what I want to do in my life is write. Um, I've already got a book out called The Catalyst. Where if you Google um, or go on Amazon, type in The Catalyst, probably walk it, it should come up. If you want to purchase a copy, please do. If you ever want to review a copy, just send me a message. I'll get you a book sent by my publisher, um, which would be incredible. Um, but I'll also, again, I'll leave my Twitter in the description below. I'll leave my website in the description below. And I'll leave my Instagram in the description below. Um, they're all personal websites. It's nothing to do with this um, killer, tea spiller specifically. But my last um, video, um, obviously I'm just starting out, but already my website had more views from the last video than it, like in one week, than it has in any sort of um, contained time frame whatsoever so i really appreciate whoever actually went onto the website and read anything um please again feedback is so so um important and so so incredible for me like it really helps me improve in a lot of ways um i know my writing style is not for everybody but i like to play with different writing styles if anybody wants me to tackle a certain writing style or a certain theme please let me know i'd love i love any ideas i will credit you obviously when i actually start putting these stories up here and also, if you've got any case you'd like me to look over, please, by all means, either send it over via the website, which has got a contact me section, or message me on Instagram, message me on Twitter, give me a follow, just tell me that you follow me from the YouTube video and you would like to either give me some feedback on a story, you've got an idea for a story that you want me to write for you. Again, completely free. I just want to create more and more work and you will get the credit. Um, yeah, just thank you so much for being so supportive. Thank you so much for watching another video of mine. And thank you so much for either subscribing. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate it. So hopefully next one won't be as long as this one took. Again, I'm, I'm not, I've got no routine. I've got no schedule that I need to stick to. So I'm just waiting to find a case, do the research as and when I can. But thank you so much for joining this episode of Killer T Spiller. And hopefully I'll see you next time.